Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. I got my sexy, sexy mic for nice sound, so this won't be a <laughs> ASMR video, hopefully. All right, Pokemon Adventures, Ruby and Sapphire, Volume 20. This is such a boss children's comic. Like, and, and that's like the overarching thing of, of all of these reviews. Is This is a manga about like 10 year olds and 11 year olds that take on evil organizations with cool cartoon monsters and uh, fight at them and, and beat at them and they collect all the Pokemans. But uh, looking at it as an adult, uh, Hidenori Kusaka is like so admirable in his his craft of storytelling. Uh, I've said it before, so I'll repeat it here just in case you haven't seen any of these reviews before, but he researches every game carefully, looking for de cool details to pull inspiration from. This is the third story arc, and this is the third time we are getting a complex uh, final battle fought on multiple battlefronts with different organizations, each with their own uh, ulterior motive, competing with the good guys. There are about 18 characters all fighting each other. Now, the main characters get the most development, but all of the 18 characters at least have, like, a bit to them, or, like, a cool, memorable uh, motif or gimmick or personality trait. Or something cool that just kind of, like, makes them stand out. Uh, and I, it, it's just absolutely fascinating, like, the level of complexity that uh, Kusaka is bringing to the plot of a Pokemon manga. Also, Satoshi Yamamoto, uh, I really praise Mato, who is the artist for, I think, the first nine volumes or so before she fell ill. She had a very charming, unique style, uh, maybe a little bit more inspired by the limited graphics of the early games, uh, where Satoshi Yamamoto has a little bit more of a traditional shonen jump style, a lot more kind of like dynamic action scenes. So it's almost like Hidenori Kusaka is now writing in a way that blends with Satoshi Yamamoto's uh, maybe like slightly more dynamic style. So I'm just going to like hop into it because as as you see how he's building it, like it's amazing how many different elements he's bringing together. So last time Ruby the Femboy and Sapphire the Tomboy uh, were diving to the bottom of the ocean to uh, defeat Team Magma and Team Aqua and save the world. But that's just that's just one subplot. Are you ready? After like five volumes of like neat character development and watching them be Sundere and will they won't they? We're now building up to a climax and a climax with like continual battles, all of them leading up to bigger battles. So here we go. While those two are doing that, it's time for a whole new protagonist. So it's not just two protagonists. We've got a third we we now have a third protagonist being introduced right before the the final battle. So one of the things Hidenori has to do is he has to establish a lot quickly. We we've met Wally before. He was a sick kid that Ruby took pity on and kind of taught him uh how to catch his first Pokémon and basically just encouraged him like, "Look, just cuz people tell you you can't do this, if if you have endurance, you can you can still do this. So while he's fighting some sort of mystery disease, can't cancer, some, something respiratory, uh, he's introduced to Trico. So another neat thing is if you are a kid and you play these games, every kid's going to have their own favorite Pokemon. So Hidenori basically makes sure that each of the main Pokemon at least get a little moment in the sun, and he uses a lot of the less famous Pokemon for inspiration for different scenes. So there might be like a little battle here and that Pokemon has some cool ability or something and he'll use that to add a little twist -a -roo to a battle scene. So the three starters are three of the most important Pokemon because it's who you, it's basically who you pick to start with in the game. He wants to make sure that Trico gets uh, its moment in the sunlight too. Now Norman, Ruby's dad, uh, kind of like the ultimate Chad, Chad dad, uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with this battle between Team Aqua and Team Team Magma. Uh, what is this? Is, is it Aqua and Magma? Yeah, ba basically, uh, when forced to choose between two evils, cho choose neither. And Norman's uh, training style is to throw you into a dangerous situation and trust that you will you will survive. <laughs> he, he very uh, uh, what, what's it? A very like tough football coach dad approach. But Wally digs it because that means that Norman's actually taking him seriously and he's going to let him be a Pokemon uh, trainer. Now, uh, what's neat about this is when Ruby was encouraging Wally, 
Norman didn't believe that Wally had it in him. He thought that his illness basically meant, Hi, Luna. Uh, oh, boy. Hey, Luna. You, now you're... you're Cuddles. Uh, you, if you saw the update video, Cuddles passed away uh, this month. <laughs> and no sooner does Cuddles pass away than Luna's going to come here and be the new <laughs> guest star cat. Where was I? All right, so... Uh, Norman is giving Wally his crash course. And it's kind of neat because for Norman, it's a twist to where he, he had trouble accepting that his son had a different path in life than what he envisioned. So it's sort of like now he's training someone else in a way like th that he wanted to do for his son. Oh, one more neat thing. So because we're introducing a whole new protagonist, he needs to go on an arc, right? So a neat little thing that happens really quickly is... Uh, Wally rescues Trico, but he does so in kind of a risky way. So Norman appears and asks him, well, why did you do that? Were you just so confident in yourself that you thought that it would go okay and you wouldn't hurt Trico while you were trying to save him? And Wally made the point, I, I trust my Pokemon. I'm not that great, but I, I, I trust in my Pokemon to c carry through even in a dangerous or tense situation. So he, he can make snap decisions like that without overthinking it. Uh, what's neat about that is basically each trainer needs like a philosophy of why they are a Pokemon trainer and different trainers express their relationship to Pokemon in different ways. Some of them see them as friends. Some of them see them as partners. Some trainers see them as family. So Wally's kind of way of looking at his Pokemon is he trusts them to help him even when he's not sure in himself. That's pretty neat. So we know that he's not the most self-confident guy, but he has kind of like that basic, I don't know, he has the basic moral requirement of a good trainer. Now, uh, what I love about Team Magma and Team Aqua is they have the most basic motivations ever. <laughs> Team Aqua hates land and they want to cover the world with oceans. And uh, Team Magma hates water and they want to dry up all the oceans of, of the world. Uh, but there's a cool little twisteroo where uh, both they, they even though they're enemies of each other, they both agree that they want to release the the legendary water Pokemon and the legendary land Pokemon. So they want to find out which is stronger, land or water. So the two, the two kind of like titanic, uh, godlike Pokemon are going to have their epic battle. So what's neat about this is they're enemies to each other, but they temporarily shared a common purpose. Let's unleash the two uh, Pokemon and cause a cataclysm. Uh, Magma was doing some sneaky stuff behind the scenes, so Archie uses his wits and figures out someone's interfering in this battle. Uh, the two of them have it out, and each of them have an orb now. So before, Team Magma was trying to interfere to make sure that Groudon won and that all the oceans would be evaporated. Uh, now Archie has even this even the scales. So both of them control one orb. That means that they control the legendary Pokemon that's associated with, with the orb, and it looks like it's going to come down to an even fight. Now, if it comes down to an even fight, the two of them will just fight forever, and all life on Earth will be destroyed. Where is this bookmark? Da -da 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 -da. Okay, okay. So, another neat thing is kind of like remembering all of the character relationships that were going on before the final battle uh, started getting built up. So, uh, Sapphire, typical of a Sundere tomboy, is still kind of ticked at Ruby because... Just as the fight was get, getting kicked off, Ruby said, I'm noping out of this. I don't like fighting. I'm going to go <laughs> compete in more beauty contests. But he did come through at, at the end. And he made them two adorable new outfits. I bet he sewed them himself. What is even the male word for a seamstress? A, a seamster? <laughs> a, a tailor? Is that is that it? Right. And, the, and actually, uh, Hidenori Kusaka makes the commentary that uh, he meant the change of the uniform to be a bit of a symbol of Ruby's change of heart from only caring about himself to actually having a higher purpose. So that's, re that's really neat. But uh, Sapphire hasn't forgot that Ruby, until very recently, was being an idiot. So she's chewing him out a little bit over that. But they don't have time to fight right now. They have to go, they have to go save the planet. So it's sort of like there's a more important uh, issue that's taking priority over their interpersonal uh, problems at the moment. Now... While all this is going on, some of the sub-captains of Team Aqua and Team Magma are having moments of doubt uh, in their loyalty, kind of like their cult-like loyalty to their leaders. Arch Archie gets sick of one of his captains and almost kills him. And it's really neat because the, I think his name is Amber. Amber sort of thinks through it and says, man, did, did, he, did he really betray me? No, he couldn't have. I, I have absolute faith, 
faith in my commander, but he's clearly still shaken by this. So it's kind of just like a neat moment of underscoring almost like the cult-like control the two leaders have over their two different groups. All right, now here's where things start getting really complicated and really cool. The gym leaders didn't know who were the good guys and who were the bad guys at first. Th half of them thought Team Magma were the good guys. Half of them thought Team Aqua were the good guys because they both use fake news and public outreach to make themselves, oh, no, we just, we just love oceans, in parentheses. We're going to destroy all land. Oh, no, 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 we just love land Pokemon, in parentheses. We're going to destroy all oceans. So what the gym leaders are finally figuring out is that neither of these organizations are very good. So half the gym leaders are trying to stop Groudon from destroying the Earth, and Team Magma shows up to stop the gym leaders. Meanwhile, the other half of the gym leaders are trying to stop Kyogre from, cut, from flooding the earth, and Team Aqua is trying to stop those gym leaders. So everybody has their own ulterior motive. Everybody's trying to stop everybody from stopping everybody, everybody else, and they all have their own cool superpower uh, or kind of like style of fighting with Pokemon as they're at each other's throats. Uh, I marked this because this was just a neat example of, uh, Luna, please, please, Luna, you're a good cat. I'll pet you as soon as I'm done, I promise. Okay, this is sort of just sort of a neat example of using a less famous Pokemon in a creative way. So Amber shows up and he has, I think it's called like a Ninjask or something, or Shedinja. He has like a Cicada Pokemon. And then uh, he, it's the last Pokemon he's got, he uses it. Uh, it puts up a good fight, but in the end, uh, Watson beats him. And Watson thinks, ah, I got the, I, I got you, I won this fight, you were down to your last one. And then, surprise, surprise, uh, it's a weird Pokemon where, when it evolves, it actually it doesn't evolve into one Pokemon, it evolves into two separate Pokemon, and that's the twist, Twister Root. Watson wasn't expecting one last Pokemon and then it, until it appears behind him and knocks him over the head. Poor, poor old guy, will he survive? We will have, we'll have to wait and find out. So what, what that's a neat example of is sort of just paying attention to the details of the Pokemon and just thinking, how could I use this? for excitement purposes, to have like a cool twist or a surprise as these guys are battling mid-fight. Mid it's really create, it's a really creative use of uh, how the Pokemon work in the game themselves. So here's another neat example. So Brawly's just like a fighter type guy. You know, he's not, he, he's not like the most fleshed out character, but Hidenori tries to do something to give him a little bit more of a connection to the world. So Brawly's talked before about how he once had an old friend who he trained with, and his old friend taught him uh, kind of like the judo fighting style, be, be like water. But now Brawly has to fight like a coward who won't fight him directly. And the judo techniques all depend on your enemy actually con confronting you directly, not hiding in the shadows. So he said, well, I learned another fighting style from my friend, the hard and fast style where I just beat you up uh, with, with no mercy. And he learned it from Bruno, who's a character who appeared in the first story arc. He, he was a pretty well-developed uh, antagonist. So just what's kind of neat about this is it gives Brawly, it, it helps the world feel a little bit more inter interconnected. B Brawly being friends with Bruno makes sense because they both like fighting Pokemon. Uh, and I don't know, it, it, it just makes him a little bit memorable, more memorable than, than just a guy who uses fighting Pokemon. He's a guy who learned from a character we've met and enjoyed in, pre in previous volumes. So uh, again, there, Hidenori looks at all the details of the world and he interconnects it really nicely. Uh, I mark this because I think this is supposed to be the staff of Game Freak. They sometimes put little homages to themselves in the games, and then these three show up, and one's a programmer, one's a graphic designer, and one's a game designer. So that's almost definitely supposed to be like a little homage to the creators of the original games. Uh, now, mark this because this is like a really neat use of parallelism, and it's another really neat example of Hidenori looking at mechanics of the game itself and taking inspiration from that to make a plot point that is really thematically cool and appropriate. So both Ruby and Sapphire went on their own adventure. They both fought their own set of bad guys, and they just sort of realized that they're coming to fight the bosses of the minions they've been fighting up, up to this point. So there's this parallelism where uh, he's on the right, uh, Max is on the right, Archie's on the left. Both of them are trying to take him on at the same time. Their thoughts are even paralleling each other. This is one of the really neat 
things about comic art is when you have like a parallel situation, you can literally use parallel art to illustrate the parallel situation, but there's a big difference. Maxi and Archie are not allies. They are enemies who just coincidentally had a shared goal. So they're really not working together. All they really care about is their own power trip and they only care about destroying what's in front of them. They're not working together. Ruby and Sapphire put this together and uh, what they say is, well, they're not working together. Our only chance here is the two of us have to work together and collaborate, which is great. So it's sort of like uh, the enemy of my enemy is, is my friend. Uh, that thinking guides the villains, right? They're, they're only concerned with their uh, destructive, uh, by any means necessary mentality. But the two good guys, the two friends, realize that uh, we have a higher purpose that we're fighting for, which means we can actually work together, which means we can actually fight them better. We can use, we can be better Pokemon trainers at the same time. It's kind of like making a neat moral point. Uh, and here's just like another neat example of parallelism where the two final fights are all coming together. It's not enough for them to just take out one of the legendary Pokemon. You know, either the earth will get flooded or the earth will uh, get dry up in a perpetual drought. We need to take out both of the evil guys uh, in one last spectacular battle. Uh, I have a feeling about where this is going, and it ends with just the two of them flying into the air, like the power of the orbs are turning them into like Dragon Ball Z, high, high on crack characters. And our two protagonists who were fighting together, no, they're separate, I want them to get back together. But obviously what this is building up to is an even more bigger co conflict. Now, I mentioned before game design. So Ruby and Sapphire, I think that's the generation that introduced fighting with two Pokemon at the same time. So clearly what Hidenori did is he played the game, he noticed that in this game you get to fight with two Pokemon at once, and that there are, instead of just like one team of bad guys you, you, that you have to fight, there are two teams of bad guys you have, the, have to fight. So I think what Hidenori figured out is this could work great thematically for two stories or two sets of evil coming together uh, for, for one fight one final battle. He made a moral point out of the fact that you can use two Pokemon in, in this game instead of just using one Pokemon all the time. That's just a great, fantastic example of looking at something, playing the game carefully, getting a feel for the game, and then bringing that element of the game into a story where it makes a point. It, ser it serves something bigger overall. This is such a good manga. Good grief. All right, and this is just the start. There are two more volumes that I'm sure are going to be all gigantic, cli climactic, 18 characters fighting each other fights. What a great, what a great series. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Catch you later. Boop, boop, boop. Do, 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 do. Okay. And, oh, let's adjust that. Three, two, one.